Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my 2021 Try a Story tag from the Best American Short Stories of the Century, as edited by John Updike. I have been reading uh, seven stories per year from this book for the last couple of years, and uh, all of those videos are linked down in my short stories uh, playlist that's down below. And I'll also um, specifically link to my other 2021 short story video uh, where I read uh, from five uh, different short story collections. And fun times, this collection started with a story in 1915 and goes to the end of the 20th century. And this year I am reading all stories from the 1960s. Decided to get an early start today and do some reading in bed in my PJs. And and I've just finished my first story, which is The Ledge by Lawrence Sargent Hill. This is a story about a fisherman, his son, and his nephew, who on Christmas Day decide to go duck hunting on a nearby island. And immediately it's framed as, you know, perhaps a personality-defining uh, thing that, you know, he goes out on Christmas Day of all days, you know, his wife isn't too pleased about it. Uh, you know, he was supposed to get home, you know, before the sun goes down, uh, but instead, you know, he's just this gruff, I want to do what I want man, uh, who takes the two boys and uh, they go off and uh, the day, I don't know, it, it has problems uh, from the start, like, you know, he forgets his uh, tobacco and uh, the boys are annoying him. Uh, and basically it should have been obvious to me, probably by the time his wife, who apparently got a little bit of a POV in the beginning, said she wished uh, sometimes she was a widow. What might happen at the end of this story? Um, I could extrapolate perhaps that Hall is saying if you're going to go ahead and kill living creatures, you should also be uh, at the mercy of the elements. Uh, but I don't actually think that's uh, the way this story is meant to be. I think it's meant to be what happens when a hard man faces death. So to be specific about it, you know, they go to this island, they shoot a bunch of ducks throughout the day, but then ultimately their skiff sort of unmoors and goes into the water where they can't uh, reach it. And uh, so all they have is their guns and, you know, what's left of their bullets, which they try to fire off to get help, and it doesn't come. And then high tide comes and, uh, you know, things happen. <laughs> and. Uh, in the aftermath, uh, you know, there was the dog, the two boys, and the fisherman, and only the fisherman's body is found. And I guess his uh, coming to terms with nature as a hard man sort of thing is to sort of feel some emotion toward the boys, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure there was, you know, in terms of character development, which is what I like to see, eh, it was pretty uh, light on all of that. And also, the beginning of the story was huge amounts of exposition. Like, it, we're several pages in before there's a stitch of dialogue. So it was very difficult, especially for someone who, you know, isn't in this lifestyle, to get into the story. So, eh. <laughs> Next up is Defender of the Faith by Philip Roth, because I guess I have to grin and bear it. <laughs> not a big Roth fan at all. Although, at least in the short form, it's not quite as blatantly autobiographical, and even better, there are no women for him to completely mess up in this short, this short story. So huzzah, because it takes place in army training in Missouri. Uh, the uh, premise of the story is, is that we're following this sergeant, uh, Sergeant Marx, who has returned from the German theater in World War II to train new soldiers, you know, in 1945. Um, so he's back, you know, training in the U.S., and he comes across three young trainees who happen to be Jewish. Um, and one of them in particular, a Schulman Grossbart, gets on his case, like, you know, because of shared faith, for uh, him to make allowances, as they were, for uh, the Jewish members. Uh, first of all, uh, he sets up uh, Shabbat services with the chaplain, or allows Grossbart and his true friends to go when they weren't going to before. Uh, and then things uh, spiral from there, with Grossbart wanting more and more. He wants special permission to go visit his aunt for a late Passover Seder, even though he's not supposed to leave the base, which uh, the sergeant uh, agrees to. He's like, okay, if you want to go and, you know, 
celebrate a religious ritual, go ahead and do it. And Grossbart is very good at, you know, amping up the drama to say, you know, this would be very meaningful to me and to us as Jews and our, you know, personhood together and our community together. So, you know, Marx lets that go. But then finally, um, Grossbart comes to him uh, wanting to see, you know, where, the, where they will be shipped off to after their training ends. And Marx had just learned that um, everyone will be uh, shipped off to the Pacific. And uh, I guess he's in it with uh, Grossbart and he actually tells him this. And then Marx finds out later that uh, Grossbart had, uh, had found a way to change his own orders so that he would be staying in the States. And this kind of goes with Grossbart's uh, manipulations from before, where in fact, um, he had sent a letter to his congressman pretending to be his father uh, to talk about getting some kosher food because uh, he claimed that, you know, he was throwing up from the, the non-kosher food and that, you know, you know, he grew up in a religious home and, you know, would like some appropriate food for that. Uh, so obviously he has, you know, that uh, one might say, you know, go get him attitude. Others might say a manipulative attitude. And I'm pretty sure I know where uh, Roth falls on this. Uh, Roth was very much a pro-assimilationist Jew. You know, the fact is that he always... Uh, so the best thing to do would be uh, for Jews to stop being so Jewy and so different and to assimilate to, uh, I guess, waspy Protestant American life or something like that. So it's interesting to read this story. I know that in as much as I know anything about the U.S. military in modern times, uh, they have certainly uh, made allowances for diverse faiths. You know, there have been Passover seders uh, even in war zones that I've seen. So, you know, it's not, you know, out of left field the way that apparently it was in 1945 to, you know, allow for some differences. I mean, I would assume there probably is some, some kosher food, uh, when there can be at least, and uh, certainly some uh, services and a chaplain for Jewish uh, members. Uh, but, you know, the way this story has it is, is that it's a huge inconvenience. Uh, and it just comes down again to, of course, his most blatantly Jewish character is you know, a manipulator, and uh, and he uses his sob stories and his pushiness, you know, there's a thing in here about Jewish pushiness, to get his way, and it's definitely seen as special favors that he doesn't really deserve. And another aspect of the story that, you know, really makes me roll my eyes is, is how uh, the Gentile, like, you know, higher-ups are saying, you know, hey, Marx is a good Jew because he went off to fight Nazis. You know, you don't have to, you know, stop saying that the only way to be a good Jew is for us to change our dietary laws to fit you. You know, as though it's a zero-sum game. Like, you know, either you're a good Jew by killing Nazis or a good Jew by, uh, you know, uh, attending to kosher rituals. And I mean, it's ridiculous, first of all, that uh, that's even an argument because um, US soldiers did not kill Nazis to save Jews. They killed Nazis because they were under order from the US government to do so in the name of the US government. So, you know, that's another manipulation that uh, I think Roth doesn't realize is a manipulation. But anyway, Roth and I, as usual, have a lot of differences of opinion. <laughs> But at least the story wasn't insufferable, so I'll give him that. <laughs> so it's a bit later and I'm back from work, but I'm still here reading about Jews in uh, this collection. Uh, this time uh, with Criers and Kibitzers, Kibitzers and Criers by Stanley Elkin. A kibitzer is someone in Yiddish who like, shoots the breeze in a shallow sort of way. And uh, the general theme of the story is about how people live their lives either like, you know, crying out their woes or kibitzing and shooting the breeze about nothing. We're following uh, this main character, uh, Mr. Greenspan, along. Uh, he has recently lost his son, who was 23 years old. And he sees his son basically as, you know, you know, unmarried, someone who didn't have a job or a business yet. So, you know, so he was uh, dead before his life began, basically. And of course, as a father, he's mourning. And uh, he owns a grocery uh, in town, but it seems like, you know, it's a time period where times are changing and, you know, the supermarkets are becoming a bigger deal. Or anyway, he feels a bit um, past his prime, I suppose, although I'm sure a lot of his feelings have to do with his grief. He's a man who's grieving and we're seeing him go back to work for the first day in three weeks after his son died. 
It's a long but very full story about his day, about his customers, about his employees, about the people he goes to lunch with, and all of his business transactions, and uh, how he's viewing all of them through his prickly personality and also through his grief. And then very oc occasionally throughout, he also does, you know, get choked up a little bit by the death of his son, like remembering things. Uh, and we even get to see, like, perhaps some, some memories of his son that weren't uh, quite so, you know, pristine and happy the way that you'd want, you know, your memories of a dead son to be. Uh, so I liked it. It's a story that's very uh, implicitly Jewish from, you know, he is this ethnicity from this time period, and it's showing up in, you know, the neighborhood he lives in and uh, his interactions and the fact that he's going to shul after work to, you know, pray for his son for the Kaddish. But there are universal themes as well about grief and about uh, cynicism and about changing times. And the world just felt so full. So that, like, even though it was a long short story, you know, you get a lot out of it. So, yeah, I really liked this one. Continuing with the Jewish theme, but uh, heading back to the Holocaust with The German Refugee by Bernard Malamud. This story follows a narrator who is a young man in 1939 making a bit of a side living um, as a student, but then making a little money on the side, uh, teaching English to German refugees. Because it was around this time where a bunch of uh, refugees, a lot, mostly Jewish refugees, uh, came over as they could from Germany. And uh, he focuses a lot on his uh, clients being really uh, well-educated middle-aged people who had really good lives in Germany, but they don't speak English very well, so, you know, when they come here, their chances for advancement and opportunity are pretty limited. So he specifically focuses in on one client, Oscar, who uh, is a recent immigrant, uh, and he had had a, a Gentile wife, in fact, but uh, the woman's uh, mother was anti-Semitic and forced the woman, you know, to basically divorce him before he left. So now he's alone. He's a literature teacher, and he's... Uh, here to make a lecture, wants to write a lecture and present it about Walt Whitman, and he's also a Weimar uh, literature professor, um, you know, from their literature. And of course the problem is, is that uh, he knows some English, but uh, he doesn't know it well enough to speak very well, and you know, Malamud puts in all of uh, the, the weird accent stuff for, you know, the translations of him speaking in English. And so our narrator tries to help him through, but there's also a bit of uh, trauma, you know. First of all, it's 1939. It's not like the war is behind us in any way. Uh, the U.S. isn't even involved yet, but uh, what's mostly going on in Europe is that uh, Germany is on the advance, that, you know, they're invading Poland, and there's a, uh, there's a treaty with the Soviet Union, so, you know, Hitler's on the rise, as it were, so it's not good times. So it really, you know... I think that, along with the loss of his life, like his career and his life in Germany, this man Oscar's life, you know, adds to his, you know, trauma. And so that, you know, sets him back for a while. But the narrator works with him diligently, and then ultimately he is able to write and uh, give this speech very well, but it's a bit of a false uh, positive ending, because the real ending, just, you know, a page later, well, harkens back to uh, the experiences of Jews who didn't leave Germany, to not get into more spoilers than that, but, uh, well, Oscar received some news. So it's a harrowing tale. Well done. There was a weird paragraph in the middle where it jumped forward in time to give some sort of uh, broad-minded opinion of what it was like for, you know, the German refugees uh, looking back. And I don't really think that was necessary for the story, but other than that, it was pretty strong. Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been by Joyce Carol Oates is a reread for me, I realized, uh, as I was reading through it, or even the title jumped out at me. I think I read it in high school. Uh, and I guess I'm glad Eric Carl Anderson uh, won't see this video, probably, because <laughs> I haven't ever been a huge fan of Joyce Carol Oates. And this story is always... I, don't, I think the first time I read this story, it really deeply offended me, and, and it does so less this time, but I still i am a bit iffy about it. Though I do think it packs a psychological punch, which it, it very much intends to. 
It's about a young girl, like 17 years old, named Connie. She's a pretty normal teenage American girl for the 60s, I would think. She, you know, meets up with her friends. She meets up with boyfriends. You know, the whole thing is about them getting a little independence from their parents. There's perhaps a sexual component, like, inching into with, uh, you know, the boys and that sort of thing. And at home, she argues with her mother, who sees her as, you know, being a little you know, too independent or a little, you know, unrefined or that sort of thing, you know, normal teenage stuff. So one day her whole family is out at a par barbecue and she isn't. And a stranger knocks on her door, a man named Arnold Friend, who has another friend in the car, and he has come to take her on a date, so he says to begin with. He's a very charismatic stranger who basically says, you know, you're going to come out, honey, and you're going to be my girl. And it becomes pretty apparent that uh, the intent is uh, to lure her out, uh, to rape her and kill her. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty... Uh, uh, explicit writing on the wall, I think, even though obviously this character is written up to be charismatic and a psychological manipulator. And uh, she stands there and uh, is basically manipulated into coming out of the house, uh, in part because uh, he says, you know, I'll stay outside unless you pick up the phone to call the police. And when she tries, uh, she, you know, has some sort of breakdown or something. <laughs> and so that doesn't work. And, you know, it ends basically <laughs> in a bad way. Uh, and, I mean, what I don't like about the story, there's a few things. I mean, there's the whole idea of uh, how unrealistic this is or rare this is. I mean, serial killers in general, strangers attacking you in general, coming to your door to attack you is pretty rare. And then there's this whole thing where he knows all the names of her fr friends and he knows exactly where her, her family is. And I know some of it is a psychological manipulation, like him saying, I see them now, you know, but he knows names and he knows details. I mean, that's a lot of time and energy to put into someone you're going to murder, which I mean, it can be done, but it still seems very rare for just, you know, a random stranger. And then there's finally something that maybe I'm reading into too much that, you know, she dedicated it to Bob Dylan after le listening to one of his songs, which seems to reiterate the point to me that she's saying, well, you know, be careful, all of you teenagers, you know, who are experimenting with it, you know, independence and sexual expression, or else you might end up this bad way. When again, you know, getting raped and murdered by a serial killer is very rare. <laughs> So I don't know, it strikes me as a little bit of sensationalism, and I've gotten that sense from some of Oates' other works as well, that it's less about a real uh, meditation on, especially on sexual assault, and, and more of a salacious melodrama. I don't know, I mean, I just think I don't really jive as well with this author as certainly many other people do, because she's very famous and very prolific. But I do appreciate, to an extent, the psychological aspect. And hey, if Arnold Friend had been someone who Connie had actually known, we could have perhaps gone more into how he'd been conditioning her for years for abuse. Not to mention that this is a far more likely story for people who are abused, that it happens within the family or with, it, with people they trust. So there's that. The Rotifer by Mary Ladd Gavel is a bit of a disjointed piece. Uh, hoping I'm saying the word Rotifer correctly. It's in the beginning section, which is uh, when the narrator is uh, in a biology lab and she's looking at this Rotifer, a very small little organism, you know, in a microscope. And the Rotifer is caught in algae and obviously fighting for its life. And she wants to help it, but, you know, given that this is a tiny little organism and she's a huge person, there's really just no way for her to properly do that. She talks about, you know, their dimensions basically not lining up. And then the next section is her again, I think it's the same narrator, uh, doing a job for her college where she is um, organizing archival papers of a prominent family. And she comes across... Uh, their history from 1832 where there's a young son who is sent off to a school in Massachusetts. The story takes place in Texas and he's sent to Massachusetts basically to learn how to be a gentleman and uh, 
the young son starts sending like really uh, formal uh, letters home, uh, obviously contrived to sound like a little gentleman, like uh, with the, my dear father and, you know, a few words of what he's up to, like I'm learning my Latin and it's all good and please give my love to my mother, your devoted son, that sort of stuff. Very stilted, although the narrator sees that he occasionally uh, sounds a little homesick and then there's some uh, reference from the school that he had the gripe uh, and was sick for a while, and then finally the uh, cousin of the little boy visits him and writes to his uh, uncle, you know, he's looking rather sick and I don't think this is a great uh, location for him. Uh, and soon after that the boy kind of uh, fades from existence. And so the narrator's getting really wrapped up in the story and kind of wanting to help the boy. And then like something in the present jolts her, like somebody comes into the library and she remembers I'm in the present and these people have been dead for years. So, you know, I have this emotion toward them and wanting them to do okay. But, you know, obviously there's this dimensional difference between us again, because, you know, they're long dead. But, you know, this one I, I understood more than the biology one. I mean, I respected the biology one because uh, <laughs> it sounded impressive, all of the biological words. But this one, uh, I think I have a little more affinity for. Uh, actually, in my 20s, I had a part-time job where I was organizing some correspondence from a museum director uh, and uh, just going through all of his mail about, uh, to various artists and vendors and, and so forth which gave a little bit of a narrative, nothing quite as uh, distinctive as going through a family's papers, but somewhat similar. So, you know, I appreciated that whole idea of like, you know, getting caught up in something you're not really a part of, both with the Rotifer and with uh, this uh, long dead family. The third section works less well for me, where the narrator is uh, meeting up with a cousin who's about to get married to this guy who the narrator recognizes as having a secret girlfriend on the side. And uh, the story goes into like a dimensional difference again because she won't tell her cousin about it. But you know, that's different. You know, that's just a choice not to be honest about these things. You could tell, you know, what's going on. It's not like, you know, looking at an organism or reading letters from old dead people. This is, you know, real time stuff going on here, you know. So it didn't necessarily work as well for me, but I enjoyed the first two parts uh, a little bit for what they were. And finally, we have Gold Coast by James Allen McPherson, which is, I believe, he is our first uh, African-American writer of this uh, seven, uh, writing about a black character, a young man who uh, works as a janitor uh, as he is in school for writing. So it's interesting. It almost... Uh, adheres, I think, to like earlier generations, like I'm thinking of Philip Roth even, just of how he left his ethnic background to like go to school to be a writer. And that seems to be what uh, McPherson's narrator is doing here. I mean, yes, he's black, but uh, in terms of uh, the ethnic divisions that come up in that, this story, uh, it's relatively muted. Uh, the narrator is working uh, as for a man called James Sullivan, who is this elderly Irish man who's worked, lived in an apartment forever. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, beef with all the rich people, and he especially seems to have a lot of beef with Jews. Uh, I think, uh, well, the story uh, frames it as that he's, you know, jealous of people who have more than he has, and everyone in, you know, the apartment, I guess, has more than he has. Although there's also interesting commentary of like, you know, you can't say anything bad about the Jews anymore or the ADL will get you. So I guess that is saying something about uh, the time period we're coming into where, you know, Jews are becoming more white. And, you know, there's references in here, too, about the civil rights movement. So it's interesting. I love reading this uh, collection of stories in chronological order because uh, oftentimes they're contemporary. So they, you know, tell us different things about uh, life and society. But there's a universality, I think, to this story in that uh, the young janitor is a young man who's uh, trying to use this gig and looking at all of the uh, people who live in this apartment to, to, as fodder for his writing. But, and he's not uh, looking inward into his own life for that. He's definitely looking outward into this apartment, which doesn't seem to have a lot of black people in it at all. Although there are some asides about his uh, interracial relationship and some jeering he gets from mostly white people and some black people as well. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting uh, reflection on a slice of life, I suppose, or a, an apartment of life. And it's a reflection on uh, the narrator's relationship with this man, James Sullivan, who, like other characters I've talked about uh, in this video, he's a cantankerous old man, but uh, this younger narrator finds something sort of, uh, if not lovable, kind of redeemable, or at least human in him. So yeah, it's an interesting story. But if I were to pick a favorite out of these seven, I would certainly go with Criers and Kibitzers, Kibitzers and Criers by Stanley Elkin. I just think that had the whole package in terms of a fully realized world and a character with a bit of an arc. So that about covers it for me now. You can find information about all the stories I've referenced listed down below. I should be back again on this channel within the next few days uh, for my Friday Reads video, so stay tuned. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.